Okay, it says I'm, oh, it's spinning, hold on. It's thinking. Put you on speaker. It it looks like I'm live. Can you see me? Uh, sorry, let me go to this group. You what? I'm going to try my phone too. Okay, because somebody's just reacted to me being live. Oh, okay. Maybe people can see me? Yeah, it looks like people can see me. Oh, I see you. Okay. I just okay, good. Okay, oh, amazing. Yes, you're here. Okay. You. Great. Great. Right, great. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks. Hey everyone, uh, this is Paul Wishmeyer, and I've never done Facebook Live before, but I hope it's working. Uh, I'm getting some good feedback that you can see me. Can you hear me as well, if you guys can respond? Okay, good. It looks like you can hear me as well, people are saying. Great. So, um, thanks for everyone for joining, and I'm, I'm thrilled I can have this opportunity to address all the questions you sent in, and thanks to Priscilla. just. Got off the phone with her to check in, and thanks to her for making this happen and, and really creating this amazing page that I think is really a huge asset to all of us that are really passionate about the nutrition care of the patients. And I'll, I'll say again, as I've said before, thanks to all of you who are on the front lines really doing the real hard work and, and, and performing the miracles, doing the care of all these patients suffering from COVID. Um, I will tell you, I'm, I'm also in the ICU this week. I actually just got home from the hospital about a half an hour ago. Uh, unfortunately, we have quite a few patients here as well. Um, we just prone some people today. And so a lot of the questions you're asking are the real life things that, that, that I'm dealing with and we're dealing with here as well. Um, although I don't think to any of the same degree that those of you in New York and New Orleans and other big cities are seeing, we, we haven't quite caught up to your curve, thankfully. And um, so we're learning a lot from you as well. So I wanna to get to your questions. I have a whole list here from Priscilla that I will start with and I will be more than happy to take questions live as well. But I'm gonna start with some of the questions that you asked. Uh, I have a list in the first one was, please clarify and talk about the calorie goals for this population. Standing is 15 to 20 kcals per kilo actual body weight for normal weight and 11 to 14 kcals actual body weight for obese. And I will say that that is approximately what we're doing to start. We are starting, and, and as you probably have seen, the Aspen SECM guidelines are advocating, and they're excellent for those of you who haven't seen them yet. The Aspen SECM nutrition guidelines for COVID, I think, are, are very well done. I think Bob Martindale and, and Beth Taylor and, and Steve and the whole group did a great job on them. So we are starting around 15 kcals per kilo. In fact, in my sickest COVID patients, like some of the people I was taking care of today who are prone and, and on um, low dose pressors, um, I'm starting at trophic feeds. And uh, uh, you know, uh, like I had a patient on 15 cc's per uh, today who yesterday we'd actually had up to goal, but he had a big residual over 500. This disease is definitely causing GI injury and GI toxicity, and, and I'm seeing more residuals than I'm used to seeing in patients. And so I, I think start for the first 72 hours or so um, in your sickest patients, now I'm talking about the ones that are potentially on pressors, the ones that are potentially prone, the ones that are potentially um, your really severe ventilated lung injury patients. Uh, and then I think after three days, that's the time you wanna escalate. Now that said, yesterday, some of these patients I had were pretty sick and we did get to go two feeds 48 hours in. And I think if your patients are tolerating the two feeds, it's not unreasonable to slowly advance over the first 72 hours and reach goal by 48 or 72 hours and, and, and see if you can't do that. For the obese patients, I think 11 to 14 kcals is reasonable. We typically do that for BMIs over 35, not 30. 
Um, sometimes they need more than that, especially somebody who you think is younger, maybe a little more active, has a little more muscle mass, you might end up a little higher than that. Uh, and then clearly the protein requirements, two to 2.5 grams per kilo on ideal body weight for the BMIs over 35. And so I think that's a very reasonable place to be um, for those patients. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna scroll down and see if anyone has any comments on that, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on. Um, please at any time, feel free to comment or ask questions about what I'm saying, because I can see your comments live right now. So the next question kind of ties to this question. Can you clarify how long we should underfeed a patient in the early phases of critical illness? Um, I, I think that's a really great question, and I think there is good data to do that. I think it is okay and probably even more beneficial to start out around that 15 kcal per kilo mark for the first two days to three days uh, for the non-protein calories. And then I think it also, given the data we have for protein ramping being beneficial um, from Arthur Van Zanten's paper, and, and feel free to ask me for any of these references, there's a good paper that Arthur Van Zanten did that shows that the best survival occurs when you start at 0.8 grams per kilo for the first two days of max protein dose, and then ramp up to 1.2 grams per kilo on day three, four, and then go to the, your 1.5 to 2 grams probably around day five. And so I think going on a protein ramp as well as a calorie ramp is probably the best evidence-based data we have. So I think as much as you can, I would, I would try to do that uh, in your patients, and I think you have good evidence for that. Um, so I think the permissive underfeeding is really this 48 to 72 hour period. Now, um, we're going to come to pressors and maybe now is the time to mention them. Uh, you know, feeding on pressors, I think we have very strong data for now. And you've seen me post some, some information about this in the paper I just wrote for critical care medicine on feeding on vasopressors. And I'm happy to share that paper as well. Uh, it just came out in January. We have very strong data that early feeding within the first 48 hours of patients who are stable and resuscitated on pressors reduces mortality up to 0.3 mics per kilo of levofed equivalent or levofed itself. And, and that's a little different than a lot of us have thought about before, but I think especially if you're in the, point, the zero to like 0.2 range or even zero to 0.1 range, there's definitely benefit, but it doesn't have to be full feeds. It seems to be the non-nutritional benefits of feeding that people are really benefiting from here. It's the microbiome, it's the vagal nerve signaling, it's the uh, benefits on gut permeability that they are getting from this. And so I, I would really take advantage of that. But again, they have to be resuscitated. When I say that, I mean the lactate should be normal. The presser dose should be coming down, not going up, obviously. It should either be stable or coming down. And realistically, I think probably is, it should be less than probably 0.2 mics per kilo, ideally less than 0.1 um, for that benefit really to be seen. So, but that's a patient that's starting at say 15 cc's an hour is a great place to just start them and leave them. And I would feed the stomach. I wouldn't feed patients on pressors in the small bowel um, because you'd really lose your monitor for gut ischemia when you feed the small bowel. So all of you using NG tubes to feed, um, I'm going to talk more about that later, but I definitely stick with that. And I would feed the stomach and start at 15 cc's per hour in the resuscitated patient and your lactates being normal, your fluid resuscitation being good, your mixed venous, if you get those being normal, are your parameters to say. And that paper that I wrote has a really nice table that gives all these parameters in it to teach you some of the basic um, cut points you can look at for when to feed and when not to feed on pressors. And I, I think I have shared that, but I can share it again on, on, the, uh, on the, um, the, 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 part, the, the website here. So the next one I got is, for the patients who are vented for a long time and possibly needing a trach, at what point do you stop permissively underfeeding the obese patient and what is the new target? That's a tough question. You know, for all of you who haven't heard, we have a new metabolic cart now that all of you um, can get called the Q Energy device. We have one at Duke that we've been using for research and now we're gonna start using clinically. It's a rapidly uh, calibrating, self-calibrating, newly FDA approved in the last two months device that we envision dietitians being the ones really running because it's very simple to use. It runs in 10 minutes and it calibrates itself. It's really a brilliant device. And I think 
Obese patients are really where we'll benefit from metabolic carts. We're about to start a study at Duke. Hopefully it got IRB approved today. We're hearing tomorrow from the IRB. Where we're gonna do longitudinal metabolic cart readings every other day from admission to discharge in COVID patients. So we'll get a lot of data soon. I know there's some other investigators in Europe doing the same. But in the obese patient, it's very hard to judge. And I think um, the time to stop permissibly underfeeding is the time when they get more and more active. So one of the things one of my fellows said to me the other day is we can't stop practicing the good critical care we do in terms of early mobility and physical therapy just because a patient has COVID. And so as patients become more active and start rehabilitation or are coming off the ventilator or maybe now are trached and starting to be more active, um, you need to kind of think about maybe ramping your calories up some and, and your new target. I don't think I can give you a magic number. There is some metabolic heart data from some of the obesity and critical illness data papers that implies maybe even 17 to 20 kcals per kilo um, of actual body weight may be okay later in care. Um, but, but no one really knows and the data is not really solid. So I think you use your best judgment. Uh, I think somewhere around 15 kcals is probably a reasonable place to be later on and you may need more and I think you have to use your judgment. The protein again is 2 to 2.5 grams per kilo on ideal body weight in the BMI is over 35 and so you can stay with that. The next question that I got was how could you how would you calculate needs for underweight patients right where like you probably are seeing um, we definitely are seeing a lot of patients from rehab centers, from acute care centers, from long-term care centers, and, and lots of institutionalized patients who are coming in malnourished with COVID. Unfortunately, that's a lot of what we're seeing in North Carolina. Um, and, and that's tough, right? So I think those are patients that you will get to this, but you want to start teeping sooner if they won't tolerate two feeds for sure. And I think those are patients you can feel better at, at 48 hours moving towards the 25 to 30 kcals per kilo because they have less reserve. Um, and I think those are ones, again, ramp the protein up after 48 hours. Uh, I don't know that you need to markedly overfeed them. Again, a lot of these patients are going to be paralyzed or lice patients are not going to be moving much. They're going to be significantly sedated on the vent. I don't think you need to go to more than 25 to 30 kcals per kilo. We've been doing some metabolic carts in some of these really malnourished patients and we're not getting... Um, resting metabolic rates that are significantly high. I mean, we're seeing, you know, for these low BMIs, 1,500, 1,300, 1,200 kcals as a rest of metabolic rate. And as they start to do rehab, sure, your calories should go up. But again, we're not seeing these high calorie needs in these patients. So I don't think you should be overfeeding them. I think that risk is greater. So I think for the underweight, I think still the 25 to 30 on actual weight, and, and I would welcome all of your comments on what you guys are actually doing, because I don't think this is a gray area none of us have great data for. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions on the, on the website here about doing metabolic carts. We are about to start doing metabolic carts in COVID patients. Remember, a metabolic cart placed into the ventilator circuit happens after the filter in most cases, um, and your respiratory therapists who are in the room anyway can do this if you have one. I, I do think it's a reasonable thing to do, and you're tough to calculate patients. Again, Having worked with dietitians, some of whom I see on tonight, hi Jackie and others, um, in University of Colorado and at Duke, you guys are excellent at calculating needs and I think you do a great job. It's the hard to calculate patients, the obese patients, the obese elderly patients where a metabolic card can help. Although we don't know a lot about COVID, it has a massive hyperinflammatory response. I'm gonna be fascinated the next week or two as we start to do regular metabolic cards to see what that is and I'll keep you guys updated. So, um, Parameters to, to, to measure, this is the next question, parameters to measure when not to feed and when is it safe to feed. And this really gets back to, and I see questions coming about proning already um, to, on, the, on the side here. Uh, I posted a paper the other day that was just published a few months ago that showed that early feeding within 48 hours of, the, of um, paralyzed patients first, let's start with them, um, Paralysis is definitely not a contraindication to feeding. You should definitely be trying to feed your paralyzed patients. Um, I, I have a question in front of me from, from Jennifer Pletcher that says uh, they're hesitant to feed using paralytics. There's no reason not to feed on paralytics. Uh, and this paper out of Japan and thousands of patients showed that there is a mortality benefit for the patients fed within 48 hours on paralytics versus those not fed. So you have evidence, and I'm happy to share that paper again, you have hard evidence that you will reduce death rates in very sick patients who are paralyzed if you feed early. And again, it doesn't have to be the goal. I just would start at 15 and start to ramp up. Um, we had a patient just today that 
was we paralyzed last night and he was getting two feeds at goal and he developed a big residual. So I brought him back to 15 and I'm gonna see how he does tomorrow. He's been tolerating him so far. But if I can't get him to go over the next day or two, then I'm gonna start TPN. Even though, you know, he's 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 a little little on the malnourished side, but he's not severely malnourished. Um, but but he's somebody our protocols and we'll talk about this on the new SECM Aspen guidelines are suggesting TPN sooner. And he's one that I think we'll try to start sooner if I can't continue to advance him over the next few days. But we are feeding him, he's prone and he's paralyzed. And so we have other patients like that too in our other across our, our hospital ICUs that are prone and paralyzed and being fed. And so you can definitely do that. So in terms of, again, when to feed and when not to feed on vasopressors, you heard me talk about that. I think when the pressors doses are coming down and the patient's lactate is normalized and the ICU docs feel that they're resuscitated, that's when you start feeds at 15 and you're gonna really benefit the patient and reduce mortality like the publication showed. Um, so I don't think paralytics are contraindication of feeding. You can see in the SCCM GASPIN guidelines that there's now some data in prone patients that it is safe to feed them. Try to get the bed into reverse Trindelenburg at about 20 to 25 degrees to get them up a little bit. But it does appear to be safe to feed the prone patient. Remember they have a protected airway with that endotracheal tube with a cuff that should protect them. Uh, and we have been feeding them and I'm feeding people now that are like that. And so, and now there's some data to support that being safe. Um, there isn't a lot of data. Uh, there isn't large studies, of course, of this, but I, I do think it's safe and it's gonna be necessary where there gonna be a lot of prone patients. Um, and so I'm just looking at some of the questions to look at this. Uh, how concerned on ECMO? We'll talk about that. Um, 15 K cows per kilo is a question from Ashley uh, here that says 15 K cows per kilo of actual or ideal. I think in the non-obese patient, I would do actual. In the people over 35, I would do ideal. Um, so I think that's really helpful. Um, thoughts on bolus and gravity feedings when you run out of pumps. And I've been seeing a lot of you be really creative. It's really impressive what you guys are doing. Um, I just gave a lecture on this at Society of Critical Care Medicine. That is available online if you have um, access to the attendee videos. Um, this was the topic they asked me to speak on. Uh, there is a lot of data for bolus feeding and gravity feeding. I will tell you at Duke, our trauma surgeons for many years, long before I came, have been bolus feeding their trauma patients with good results for many years. It is safe, it is effective. The ESPEN guidelines demonstrate there's no difference in gastric residuals or gastric uh, aspiration events um, in bolus feed patients. Uh, those of you who know Danny Baer, she's a PhD RD in England and Zun Puticherry. They've just finished a study of very sick patients that will be out soon where they've looked at feeding with bolus versus continuous feeding in very sick ICU patients. No difference in risk. It was equally safe. Um, there was a little more glucose variability, a little more insulin need in the bolus fed patients, but I think that's a trivial price to pay for being able to feed your patients. So I think you can definitely be considering bolus feeds and gravity feeds when you don't have pumps. There's some hint, and this is one of the things they're studying in England right now, that clearly bolus feeding may be more beneficial on muscle anabolism. We as humans are built to bolus feed. We have a much greater response in our muscle anabolism if we go from low levels of amino acid in our bloodstream to high levels intermittently every few hours. So there's a lot of thought that actually bolus feeding is gonna be much better for muscle recovery. We have evidence of that in the well literature, well literature and some of the animal literature. And so I think there probably is some promise for bolus feeding maybe being better than continuous feeding. And I can tell you a good chunk of the patients in my ICU, the surgical and trauma patients are being bolus fed now routinely anyway. So I think you guys should feel good about doing that. Um, I don't think I would do it in prone patients with much more volume than 30 to 60 cc's at a time. I would keep my volumes much smaller in the sicker patients, the prone patients. Um, I would be very careful with that. A normal amount to bolus is about 150 cc's. Uh, I shared some, some of the slides from my talk. There's some great review papers. Uh, Paul Merrick wrote one, actually has a nice bolus feeding algorithm in it that was in critical care, I think it was, and I can share that, uh, that used about 150 cc's um, every three hours. That's the bolus regimen we use at Duke a lot. And so 150 to 180 is a very reasonable Q3 bolus regimen um, if you wanna use that. I would not do that in the prone patient. I would not do that in your really sick patients. I'd keep those volumes much smaller, say 30 cc's, 40, 50 cc's at a time. Um, because we just don't know uh, what that would look like. So let me move on. Choice of intral formulas and immunomodulating formulas. I would not use 
immune modulating formulas with significant amounts of arginine in these patients. The data that we saw risk in in the years past, Aaron Highland exposed this risk, um, was in older patients with pneumonias, had a higher mortality when they received arginine-containing tube feeds. They were reasonably significant amounts of arginine. We're talking more than probably eight to 10 grams a day in these tube feed formulas. I would, as, all, as much as you can, avoid giving the immune modulating formulas early in the very significantly ill pneumonia acute respiratory failure patient. I would, I would use your, your formulas that don't have a lot of arginine in them for that period. Um, we really like the peptide formulas because they have a great protein to calorie ratio. Our dietitians love them and with good reason. Uh, I would balance that risk. If you're gonna be giving more than 10 or 12 grams of arginine, I would think hard about not using that in the initial stages of the acute respiratory failure of COVID because we have data for arginine creating risk in that population. I'd think hard about that and probably not do that. Um, I wouldn't worry about the glutamine so much unless they're in renal failure. So if you have formulas of glutamine in them, I can't think of one that would be glutamine alone, obviously, but uh, that's probably not a problem as long as they're not in renal failure and as long as they're not severely in shock, say on pressors and things. But I, in general, would avoid the immune modulating formulas until they're out of respiratory failure. Uh, so I, I, I would be very careful about that. Um, let me move on to the next question. In terms of modulars, I, I think in terms of what protein you would give as a, as a, as a modular protein, definitely stick with your whey proteins. The, the um, collagen proteins are not a protein that's beneficial to muscle mass. It's not a biologically ideal protein for a human. Use your whey protein supplements. Um, so I, I think you could probably give up to 20 to 30 grams at a time. In fact, there's pretty good evidence in some studies, not in ICU patients, but in um, healthy patients and, and others that are active, that 30 gram bolus of protein actually optimizes muscle gain and probably is the most beneficial way you can give protein. And so one of the ways you might think about doing is doing some intermittent boluses of between 10 and even up to 30 grams of protein. 20 might be easier given the volumes you're giving, but somewhere between 10 and 30 grams at a bolus every so many hours, uh, I think would be very reasonable, but try to stick with the whey protein supplements. Uh, in terms of, oh, after prokinetic agents and semi-elemental formulas is tried and gastric feeding is not tolerated, would your general feeding be appropriate and is there risk? Um, there is risk. Uh, we are not doing almost any jejunal tube feeds right now. Um, and we're not having, we have a core track feeding tube team that our dietitians are outstanding at. Um, they have thousands of placements very safely. They place all the feeding tubes in our hospital. Uh, and we are not doing that because we don't want to expose them to that risk. And I really think in these sicker patients, you're probably better off feeding the stomach and having that monitor of gastric residuals which I know there's data and I endorse that data that in the average MICU patient, it's worth not following residuals. I would be following residuals in these very sick COVID patients. This disease definitely affects the gut. We've had some patients in our hospital and you may have seen them too, that we've had negative nasal swabs on even up to three times and positive gut stool corona. So this sometimes majorly affects the gut and it's not even showing up in their nasal swabs, which is a little scary actually because the nasal nasal swab takes them off isolation. We had a patient, we've had patients, others have had patients who had negative swabs, but then positive stool and actually had the disease. And so that's something to think about. Um, so this affects the gut. And so I, 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 I'm not a fan right now of the post feeding. If you have an IR group that'll put them in, some of our APPs, our PAs and MPs, are trained uh, to put in uh, core tract tubes and post product tubes. And so I think it's reasonable um, if you have that kind of situation to do it occasionally, but there's risk here and I don't think the risk justifies the benefit. There is a large randomized trial of post feeding in ICU patients versus gastric feeding. The Australians, Andrew Davies did, critical care medicine a few years ago. No difference in pneumonias, no difference in outcomes. Um, it's really hard to justify a post tube when there's risk like this, when there's no benefit that's been seen. So I, I wouldn't do it. Then the next question was, please elaborate on lower thresholds to switch to PN. That is in the Aspen SCCM guidelines. This is a very catabolic disease we think we're seeing here with COVID. It is clearly affecting the gut and causing toxicity that we haven't seen before. Um, I think if you get to 72 hours and you've not been able to start feeds, I would start TPN. Um, and there's not a number given in the Aspen, Aspen guidelines, uh, I'm sorry, the Aspen guidelines, 
But I think somewhere between 72 and, and, and 96 hours is a very reasonable time if you're not able to start feeds to start TPN. It's a very catabolic disease, and there's a lot of risks involved with, with postprotic tubes and all the other things. And I think it'd be very reasonable to do that. And I want to emphasize to all of you, if you haven't seen this data, there is no risk of infection greater than giving saline through a line for TPN. So TPN carries no infection risk versus enteral nutrition. So you can't say there's a risk of infection from TPN anymore, and that's a reason not to start it. There's four large randomized trials, one in New England Journal, the Calories Trial, two in, in Lancet, and one in JAMA that all show when you can randomize ICU patients to PN or enteral nutrition in working gut patients, these are patients that could be enterally fed, no difference in infection. So there is no risk to starting it, especially if the patient already has a central line. Obviously, if you have to put a central line in, you have to weigh the risk of the central line itself. But there's no risk any greater than putting IV fluids through that line of putting TPN through that line as long as you're doing good line care. So I don't think you should hesitate to start. I think you should think about it 42 to 72 hours. Um, if you're not able to start feeds, I would think about TPN. If you are not to goal, I would say at 72 to 96 and you're not even at 50%, I would start supplemental PN. Um, we have some data in malnourished patients. There's some, some benefit there. The SPN trial Meta Burger did and Lancet showed benefit for sure of reduced infections and some other benefits clinically, reduced the other time of supplemental PN started after 72 hours. So I think if you're at less than say 60% of goal at, at 72 hours, think about it, supplemental. If you haven't started two feeds, you don't see them starting at 72 to 96, I would start TPN. Um, let me see the next one. If two gentle feeds are recommended, limit the exposure. This gets back to the same question. Um, I don't think I would go out and be putting in, especially for you guys, if you're doing it, don't go be putting post pilot tubes in these patients. The risk is too great and there's not proven benefit. Um, I see a question about starting TPN if they're, even if they're hemodynamically unstable. I would not do that if you have patients persistently hemodynamically unstable. That's a real problem. Those are patients, of, sadly, of course, that don't have great um, potential for survival. But if they're on low dose pressors or stable dose pressors, less than 0.2, their lactate's normal, they're resuscitated, that, that patient's fine for PN after, say, 72, 48, 72 hours. I think that's fine. Um, but if they're hemodynamically unstable or if they get really shocky in the interim after you've started TPN, I would, you know, bring it back to some D10 and I would be very, you know, careful about the hemodynamically unstable patient getting either EN or PN. And so I think that's a good question someone asked. Um, I see one question about if they're receiving trickle feeds from Abigail Clapham and I think Again, if you're getting trickle feeds and you're up to 72 to 96 hours, especially it's probably 72 to 96 is that window, uh, I would start peeing if you're not able to advance because that's a, now you're under feeding and you're into that window where we probably should start feeding more. Um, feeding while prone, again, this is one of the most popular questions. Clearly, um, I do feed while they're prone. Um, I think that's a useful thing to do. I'm doing it right now in my patients. We're doing it across the hospital. Uh, I don't see any precautions for continuous feeds, although I'd try to get the bed in reverse T-Berg if you can. Um, I don't think you should have to think about a max rate. There is some publications. If you look at the SCM Aspen guidelines that have come out for COVID, they reference a publication that looked at this uh, and it showed safety. And so I think you can feel okay about this. Um, bolus feeding, I would keep my boluses smaller in the prone patient. I probably wouldn't go much above 30 to 60 cc's at a time, um, which I know is limiting, um, but, but I think on the to err on the side of safety until we know more and then f check some residuals in those patients right see what's going on um, if they don't have residuals maybe bump it up a little bit because now we're into territory we just don't have an answer for um, excellent question do you need to hold feeds prior to the transition which i'm guessing means flipping um I, I, you know i've been talking to some of my colleagues and I, I think i would what i would do is right before you flip i would stop the two feeds and suck out the stomach so that if the the endotracheal tube gets dislodged in that flip process, it's safer to put it back in without an aspiration risk, at least to the best of your, our abilities. And so I think the risk of the tube being extubated, the patient being extubated in that flipping period is real. And so what could be best if you can do it is stop the two feeds before the flip, have the nurses aspirate the NG tube, and then do the flip and then restart them. And I think that's a very reasonable, safe thing to do. I see a question about less than 0.2 mics per kilo for all types of pressors. I will tell you that I did find when I was doing this review paper some evidence that there are different safety levels of pressors for feeding. So that 0.2 refers to norepinephrine or norepinephrine equivalents. 
I think um, probably epi is not so different, but norepinephrine seems to be the safest pressure to feed on from the data I could find. Neo um, is probably second, um, not as good as norepi. Uh, dobutamine is very safe. It, you know, it increases cardiac output. It's not a vasoconstrictor, so dobutamine seems to be safe. Um, the least safe pressors to feed on appear to be uh, in order epinephrine, dopamine is worse than epinephrine, and vasopressin is the worst, especially if you get above 0.03, 0.04, and hopefully you're not. So, but vasopressin is, we know, gut constrictor, and so it has some risk. Um, maybe not so much at the lower doses. It's hard to know. We don't really know, but dopamine is definitely risky. Um, epinephrine has more risk as well. And I think for epi, I'd probably say if you're on more than 0.1 of epi, I would not be feeding because um, now you've got mixed shock probably going on and that's a challenging patient. Um, the neo doses, hopefully you guys aren't, you don't have doctors using neosinephrine. That's not a good ICU drug. Patients that get neosinephrine in place of norepinephrine have higher mortality rates. It's very clear in a recent trial that was done. So hopefully you're only using norepinephrine for sepsis and your pressor needs unless you have cardiogenic shock and then you know, you're using epidurodobutamine and hopefully those are the only pressures you're seeing. Dopamine is not a good pressure to use and it has risk and hopefully you guys aren't using that. It's not something we use too much. Um, PN, so I'd like to get uh, some clarification. The question says on what exactly it means to have lower threshold for PN, like two days or five days. And so I think you heard me say, we seem to have data that it's okay to trophically feed or underfeed and it may truly be beneficial for the first 72 hours for protein and calories. Um, I think if you start to get to 72 hours and you aren't starting feeds and you can't start feeds, um, I think I would be starting PN. Uh, and then I think if you are not getting past 50, 60% of goal by 72 to 96 hours, um, I would start supplemental PN. And so that would be my answer to that. And so I, I think that's where I would go with this. Um, uh, I just saw Judy King, of course, who I know, um, when checking GRVs. We do. Um, we do worry about that, but we are every so many hours checking them. And I did have a big one uh, in a patient yesterday um, that I didn't expect um, who was getting sicker. And so I, I, we're seeing more residuals. You probably all are seeing more residuals. I think you can do it carefully. You know, our nurses have the face shields and the masks on. And I mean, as long as you feel the nurses are safe, I think I would do it. Um, again, if you don't feel that you have the PPE that you need, I might not do it right. There's evidence that it's okay probably not to check, but this disease has gut toxicity that seems to be unique. Um, I see a question about polymeric versus peptide feedings. Um, I, I like peptide feedings. It's what we use in our ICU a lot. There is not evidence that they are better than polymeric feedings, so I, I, I can't tell you that there is, and I think polymeric feedings are fine. Uh, we like peptide feedings. I think it's a, a Duke thing. Um, I think we like them because they have such a good protein to calorie ratio. Now, the downside is these, some of these peptides have a lot of arginine in them, and I'm not a fan of the arginine in the COVID patient, and so you got to balance that. Um, I think what's great about them is they have a great high amount of protein to a lower amount of calories, so you're not overfeeding calories, and that's why we love them in our ICU, and our, our Leslie Murray, our dietitian, I think is really smart, um, really made that our go-to tube feed in our, in our surgical and I, uh, medical ICU. Um, but, but I think you got to think about it as the arginine levels start to get higher in these contents of these tube feeds, balancing that out and probably not choosing that as much. Um, so hypertriglyceridemia, I see it in the TPN and, you know, I, I've been hearing they're seeing a lot of patients, are, are, a lot of different centers are seeing a lot of hypertriglyceridemia. It's probably the propofol. Um, we're using a lot of propofol. And um, that's a challenge. Um, I had some patients today, I really tried to wean the propofol back. Propofol has a lot of toxicities, right? It's not the triglycerides. Propofol is in omega-6 intralipid, right? That is an immune suppressant and pro-inflammatory mediator, which I really don't want on my COVID patients when they need their lymphocyte function. Omega-6 lipid in the propofol inhibits lymphocyte function. So it's probably bad for the virus infected patient and then it causes more hyperinflammation, which is bad for the COVID patient. We know this is a cytokine storm disease. So I would not, I would try to get off propofol as much as you can. In our paralyzed patients, I've gone to unique combinations and I have to credit Emory with some of these ideas, but um, I'm using ketamine, very low dose propofol and a little bits of in intermittent Ativan. Uh, 
there's a lot of creative combinations out there. Ketamine as an infusion is a wonderful drug. I've used it many times in my career in the burning and other places. It creates amnesia and analgesia and it doesn't have all the risks of the propofol. The other problem propofol has is it's a direct mitochondrial toxin. Propofol increases ICU acquired weakness. It causes propofol infusion syndrome. It's a uh, electron transport chain inhibitor. It inhibits mitochondrial function. It causes muscle cell death. And that's what leads to the propofol infusion syndrome and the ICU acquired weakness. You don't want that in these patients. They're gonna get it already. Try to get people to limit the propofol use and to balance that out with ketamine. Um, benzo infusions are not good for people's brains. I wouldn't be using benzo infusions except for, for limited times, although sometimes in the paralyzed patient, you're stuck. The, the high triglycerides is really happening and I don't know why it's happening. I don't understand it, um, but I know it's happening and I check them every day on my propofol patients and we go off of it when they go high. And so I would do the same for you guys. Um, use of SMOF. All of you who are not using SMOF lipid and all of your ICU patients, find a way to start using it. It is clearly better. There's a new meta-analysis that shows reduced infection, reduced length of stay in ICU patients who get a fish oil containing lipid versus traditional omega-6 lipid. I would advocate to you, and I said this in my Aspen lecture last week, for those of you who saw it, there is no patient in the United States who does not have a fish allergy that should be getting traditional intralipid anymore. All of these patients or should be eating SMOF. At Duke, in May of 2017, we made a wholesale switch. We only use SMOF in every patient. It costs a few more dollars, literally three to five more dollars per bag. That is a trivial cost compared to the length of stay reductions and infection reductions that these lipids have. There's now also an olive oil lipid available that has very good data as well um, from Baxter, so um, that I hear is the same cost as intralipid. So again, both these lipids have trivial cost relationships to the intralipid. Do not give intralipid as much as you can to a COVID patient. It is going to impair their immune system, it's going to cause hyperinflammation. And if you're not using SMOF, get it through your PNT. You, there's just no reason a patient in the United States should be getting intralipid ever anymore. We use the SMOF in our home patients. That's what we've switched to. I, I like the olive oil lipids too. I think both of these lipids are far superior to the intralipid. So um, that's my comment on that. And I think that is a big deal in these patients as well. Uh, macronutrients and, and supplementation. So uh, as all of you probably have heard that do I see you, there is this study that showed that vitamin C, thiamine, and steroids improved outcome. I, I'm a believer in that data. The Australians have done a trial subsequently that looked at vitamin C and thiamine um, and steroids versus steroids alone and didn't see a difference. There's a large US ongoing trial that's looking at this as well. They're including COVID patients, so they're being studied right now. Um, I have some patients uh, that after my experience, I was a burn physician in Colorado. For those of the dietitians from Colorado that are listening know that. Uh, we know that giving vitamin C to patients with lung injury reduces lung leak. Um, we've done it in the burning for many, many years. We can reduce their flu requirements by half. Um, I am giving a gram and a half of vitamin C to my really severe prone, paralyzed, and very severe lung injury patients with um, COVID right now. I'm giving one and a half grams IV Q6. Um, we know that reduces fluid leak in the lung. Um, and I think there's real potential for benefit here with very little risk of harm. And so I would advocate you do that. We also know that one third of patients that come in with sepsis to the ICU, this is published in an NIH trial, are thiamine deficient. Again, you're not gonna send thiamine levels and get them back for a week. You don't know who they are. Thiamine costs a dollar to give. It has no risks, 200 milligrams, IV, BID, and I'm giving that to my sick COVID patients because it improves survival and reduces lactate in patients who are thiamine deficient, and a third of them are in the general population we've discovered that are coming in with sepsis. You don't know who they are, and you have no risk in giving it, and there's almost no cost. So I would advocate giving those two things to your sicker COVID patients. Vitamin D also is probably very important. We know vitamin D is essential to lung immune function and to lung immune clearance. Uh, macrophages depend on it, lymphocytes depend on it. I would be checking vitamin D and I'd be repleting it with 50 to 100,000 of D3. Lots of you have pediatric liquids you can use down the feeding tube to do that. Um, I would be repleting D3 um, whenever you can uh, and checking it because it's really important to lung function. You all who aren't doing it, I bet most of you as RDs are, you should be taking vitamin D too. There is a 10,000 patient meta-analysis in the British Medical Journal, I'm happy to share this online, that in regular people like us who are at risk for COVID and other viruses, vitamin D supplementation, especially if given every day, not boluses to well people, reduces your risk significantly of respiratory tract infections, viral infections, and upper and lower respiratory tract infections in general. 
So anyone who's not taking 4,000 IU of D3 a day, start taking it. My kids are taking it. My family's taking it. My parents are taking it. Um, I, I wouldn't dare walk in the hospital without having my vitamin D level be normal right now with the risk we're facing. Um, and so I think our patients deserve the same. We're thinking about designing a trial to study that. Uh, the other things, the fish oils, the seleniums, there's not any data for selenium, and short of people doing deficient, I wouldn't give it. Um, it's been studied up and down in the IC world. It's not shown benefit. Fish oil, if any of you still have a fish oil formula on your form, uh, formulas like Oxipa, I would use it. Um, it really did help people when we were using it. It's, we don't use it very much anymore. I don't think we even have it on formula anymore, but if I had it, I would use it. I don't think I would go out of my way to supplement it. If you have OmegaVin, which is the IV fish oil, I would think about giving that as a supplement, separate supplement. It is a great anti-inflammatory. We don't routinely give it at Duke. We only reserve it for our sickest of kids. SMOF has really eliminated the need for it. Um, I think the non-interlipids are gonna eliminate the need to move to omegavin in most patients because they don't get the liver dysfunction, the cholestasis on SMOF that they used to get on interlipid. But it's something to think about. Um, I haven't seen anybody do that yet. I don't see any literature about it, but uh, I would think about it. Do we think there'll be long-term related consequences from COVID and nutritional uh, issues? Yes, there will be, right? We know that ICU acquired weakness happens in all of our long-staying ICU patients that stay more than five to seven days, that are on the vents five to seven days. Um, I see a question about zinc, I'll come back to it. Um, so post-ICU acquired weakness is a big deal. It's been, we as the ICU community have recognized it, we just don't know what to do about it. I can tell you we're about to submit a trial to NIH where we're going to look at doing metabolic CART muscle ultrasound, muscle specific ultrasound, which is a neat probe all of you someday as dietitians, I hope will have in your pocket as your objective measure of malnutrition. It's an ultrasound probe about this big. It plugs into your iPhone and you can do muscle mass, muscle glycogen, and muscle quality in five minutes. And it's brilliant. And we're gonna do that in all these COVID patients every other day. And then we're gonna do BIA, advanced bioimpedance analysis for um, body composition. We're gonna do that every other day in COVID patients for admission to discharge. And then the other specific game of this grant we're trying to get is we're gonna do um, a basically a cardiopulmonary exercise test to get a targeted HIT program for patients to do at home while we watch them on an iPhone with a heart rate monitor. So we're gonna do some home-based rehab as our target um, to try to help these patients who go home because a lot of the rehab centers are gonna be closed. A lot of the post-ICU rehab stuff's not gonna be available right away and we're gonna have a lot of patients that need it. So there are going to be long-term consequences and they're gonna relate to muscle mass and muscle mass loss. For your long staying patients, the people that are in your ICU more than seven days on event, I would think about oxandrolone. We use it religiously in the burn unit all around the world. If you're in South Africa, you'd get oxandrolone. It's an anabolic testosterone derivative that has almost no liver toxicity. All the burn dietitians will know about this. Um, we're writing a study in NIH to study oxandrolone in routine ICU patients. Um, I use a lot of testosterone and oxandrolone in my long staying ICU patients. Their levels are zero when you measure them. It's very hard to regain muscle mass with a low level, so I would think hard about that. It's not been shown to affect the liver. It definitely doesn't affect, car if anything, it probably improves cardiovascular disease risk when your level's low. There's a 40,000 patient study that says you can reduce cardiovascular risk 40% if you supplement testosterone in low-level patients, low-level individuals outside the hospital. Um, hard time managing blood sugars in these patients. Um, what are your thoughts? They are hard. Um, today we, we went through a whole process to rig up an insulin drip outside the room so we could change the insulin drip from a pump outside the room in the ante room. Um, so I think that uh, that's something to think about. The problem is you can't do the glucose checks in the room because otherwise you're in the room every hour. So we kind of came to the consensus that we would do our glucose checks and our insulin drips every two hours because we had various other reasons that our nurses needed to be in the room every two hours and we had to accept that. And, and it's not perfect. I'm running some D10 at a low rate behind it to try to protect them from hypoglycemia. Um, I think I'd be curious what your experience has been around that and what you're doing with your insulin drips. Their blood sugars are hard to manage. It's the hyperinflammatory state they're in that's causing this and all the diabetic patients we have. And so, um, this is a tricky business. Um, we're having to live with every two hour checks. Um, but I, I think we, we even tried to rig up a CVP blood drawing device that ran the CVP tubing outside the room and we were gonna draw in waste and not have to go in the room, but it was just, it was 30 cc of blood, it was too much, we couldn't do it. And so uh, that's what we've had to go to. And I, I, I don't have a great answer beyond that um, for what to do about the blood sugars. We have found them challenging as well. I'm gonna come back to the zinc 
question. We don't have a lot about uh, zinc out there. Um, I think it's reasonable to think it could help the immune system, but we don't have a lot of data to say supplementing one or the other has got benefit like we do say for vitamin D or we do say for some of the other things. The other thing I'm going to compliment on, I've comment on them, and I've seen a few questions, and we're about to hopefully start a really exciting trial on is probiotics, right? We have profoundly great data for the benefit of probiotics on pneumonia and the risk of pneumonia. That's the other thing. All of you, if you're in a nice in a hospital or ICU that has COVID patients, you should be taking a probiotic, and I would recommend Lactobacillus GG. Um, I have my kids taking it, I have my parents taking it, I have my friends taking it. Um, I don't work for Culturel, but that's what I'm taking because that has been studied and shown to reduce uh, ventilator associated pneumonia by 50% in an NIH trial that Lee Morrow did at Creighton. So there is great, well done NIH funded data to show reductions of ventilator associated pneumonias with probiotics. So I would think hard about using them in your ICU in patients who don't have vascular grafts or other risk factors for probiotics. And you can look Lee Morrow's paper up in the Blue Journal. Maybe that's a paper worth posting for you guys. Um, so I think it's reasonable to think about for your patients. I would think about Lactobacillus GG that has the most data, but or clearly Lactobacillus plantarum has data. I think there's a few that probably do. GG seems to have most of the data. There's a big Canadian trial looking at Lactobacillus GG and villain associated pneumonia as well going on right now that Deb Cook is doing. The other piece is, those of you who haven't seen it, there is a 4,000 subject nature paper, the biggest, most impactful journal in the world practically, nature. 4,000 full-term infants were studied in India. They were given a symbiotic, which is a pre and probiotic together, lactobacillus and a, a probiotic FOS. And there was a significant 30 to 40% reduction in respiratory tract infections and sepsis in those full-term healthy infants over time. So much so they had to stop the study because the benefit was so enormous. And that's why the paper is in nature. So there is um, three large meta-analyses of probiotics in healthy people, adults and kids to reduce respiratory tract infections, both viral and bacterial, um, they all are positive. Um, there's a Cochrane analysis of 3,000 patients that's positive. There's a 10,000 patient one that just showed symbiotics are positive. Um, I would be taking them and I'm taking them every night, I can tell you that, and so is my family. And we have just gotten information from a sponsor um, that, that Cultural has been kind enough. They're going to give us product and we're gonna start a healthcare provider prevention trial of probiotics, Lactobacillus GG, and healthcare providers. Um, Lactobacillus plantarum, Lori, was the second one I mentioned. Uh, we're going to start a healthcare provider trial. Uh, we hope at Duke, we're, we're working on presenting it now as a, as a concept, um, and we have a sponsor now for the product, where we're going to start enrolling healthcare workers, hopefully using the HERO platform, which is a Bcornet funded platform we're using at, um, here at Duke at DCRI to study healthcare providers to see if we can randomize people to probiotic or not and reduce COVID occurrence in healthcare workers. And so we hope we can get this trial off the ground. It's gonna take a little work, but we hope we can do it soon. We also are gonna plan a trial of floor COVID patients, patients that haven't progressed to the ICU yet to see if we can prevent progression of disease. And so we're in the process of writing up those trials now and proposing, but there's really strong data for this. I'm amazed more people aren't doing it and talking about it. Um, and it's something you as dietitians can really lead the charge on because you're gonna know the most about it. And so I'm happy to post some of these papers. I'm happy to share them by email. Um, I, I will say um, here, I encourage any of you that want, you can email me and ask for some of this stuff. And sometimes it's easier for me to email some of this stuff. I'll post it too, but, but I'm always happy to email as well. My email is my name, paul.wishmeyer at duke.edu. The other place I'm posting a lot of stuff um, that I've traditionally posted on is Twitter. Um, you may have seen I, I posted my Twitter address, but I put a lot of nutrition stuff up and interact with a lot of nutrition physicians around the world, around IC nutrition and dietitians that are experts in this as well. Uh, at my Twitter account is just my name, Paul underscore Wishmeyer and Twitter. And then Instagram is of course a great place to put visual new papers, new infographics. So I do a lot on Instagram as well because I found it's a great way to, to share information and data back and forth. So that, that is Paul under, at Paul underscore Wishmeyer ND. And so um, those are great places to find some of this too, but I'm also happy to send papers by email and post them on Facebook here as well, because this is such a great resource, this, um, this Facebook page. The other piece I, I will say um, is I just last night um, with David Evans, those of you who know David Evans, he's a nutrition physician in Ohio. Um, we did a podcast with Abbott, they, they helped sponsor it. 
and that's going to appear online here in the next few days. We did a, it was a really extensive set of questions, very similar to the questions you're answering, where David and I commented on a lot of these questions. I'm going to post that podcast link as soon as I have access to it in the next few days. And so that's another opportunity that um, you'll have to, to hear some of this data talked about. Um, I have another um, ACRAC podcast I posted that I just recently did on feeding on vasopressors and feeding the IC patient um, that you can look for posts on, on this page and on Twitter and Instagram as well um, that already is out there you can listen to. So I'm going to start to look at some of your questions on here. Um, so Judy, Judy and I have done some research together. Uh, I, I see hers. Um, there are MDs oppose use of all probiotics um, with Lyme issues. That, that data just is not proven to be true. Um, at University of Colorado, our transplant ID doctors were our biggest advocates of getting probiotics on formula, which we actually never were successful in. I don't know if they have been since, but I have two different probiotics on formula at Duke that were already there when I got here. Um, we have not seen those risks with Lyme infections. Um, I think the Blue Journal paper by Lee Morrow looking at the ICU patients where they significantly reduced Villain associated pneumonia by 50% in the intention to treat group, and these were all ICU patients, many of whom had lines, is a great example of paper you can use for evidence. Um, so I, I think that's really good. Um, but I, I see, I'm going to look back through some of these questions. Would I recommend TPN over post -perloric? I would. I would do that. The GI toxicity is real. I'm seeing it real time. I saw it today, in fact. Um, it's more significant than the typical critical illness patient. This disease definitely affects the GI tract. Um, and and postpolar feeding takes away your monitor for for gastric residuals and distension, and it creates risk for us to place postpolar tubes. Um, I think if you can get one safely and easily, I would consider it. I think there's still potentially a place for it, but I, I would start TPM before I start postpolar feeding right now, given the risks associated with postpolar feeding. Um, I'm gonna look back at some of these other patients. Oh, acute kidney injury. There are other questions I got here by email from Priscilla. Uh, one of them was, let me get to it, I think it was about AKI, and that's a common question. So yes, uh, ARDS is developing AKI. Yeah, there is risk, and we're getting more and more data about this. Um, for the patient who is getting AKI and is not getting dialyzed, I would bring your protein down to 1 to 1.2, and I would not go above that. We, we definitely, in the redox trial, those of you know the glutamine trial that, that Darren Hyland and I did, we saw real risks of high protein and glutamine deliveries in patients who had renal failure without dialysis. Include, in fact, we saw increased death. Um, Zudin Pundicherry is doing some great research he presented at the ASPA meeting where he's seeing some risk as well from this high BUN to creatinine ratio that he's uh, touting. And it leads, the mechanism he's starting to figure out, which is really exciting, it appears that these renal failure patients have ammonia generation occurring because it can't be properly metabolized. And this ammonia is toxic to the mitochondria and is probably contributing to the cell death we saw in the redox trial. And so excessive protein loads in the non-CBVH or non-dialyzed renal failure patient are a big problem. And I wouldn't go above a gram, 1.0 to 1.2 grams per kilo in those patients. And especially if the BUN is really high uh, and the creatinine um, is, is climbing, I would be very careful with more than a gram per kilo. I wouldn't go less because then there's no benefit of the protein, right? Except for in the first two days maybe when you don't need to be above a gram per kilo. But I, I would keep it to one to 1.2. Now, once they're on CVVH, uh, that's a whole different story, right? So CVVH, and I should comment on this because it does a lot of unpleasant things to nutrition. Um, CVVH wastes protein, and so you need to updose your protein 30% on CVVH. So I think you need to go to, you know, 30% more protein if your patient's on CVVH than you were on before, because you're gonna lose 30% of the amino acid to the CVVH filter. The other things that you're gonna to lose to the filter that we've really discovered at Duke and we're testing these a lot, and we're gonna publish something on it soon, is copper and carnitine and vitamin B6 are wasted at enormous rates on CVVH. And we see at five to seven days, 90% of CVVH patients are copper deficient. Copper deficiency is a nightmare, right? Copper deficiency leads to pancytopenia, and most of our COVID patients are already lymphopenic and already have low white counts. Copper deficiency is gonna make that worse. And copper deficiency, if it's allowed to stand for any length of time, we know causes permanent neuromuscular weakness. Permanent neuromuscular weakness. And we don't know how many weeks it takes to do that or how many months it takes to do that. So I would be checking copper or start giving copper gluconate um, two milligrams a day is a good dose. I give it IV as well, two to four milligrams when the copper is deficient. Uh, but if you're on CVH more than five to seven days, 
especially seven days, you can almost guarantee your patient's gonna be copper deficient. More than 90% are. And that's a big deal because it's gonna affect your white cell count, it's gonna affect a muscle weakness, and, and it can cause permanent weakness, and we don't want that. Carnitine goes down as well. I'm repeating a lot of carnitine in CVVH patients. That seems to not happen as consistently, but somewhere between 50 and 60% of patients will get carnitine deficient. You need that to transport fat into your mitochondria and to use energy. So you should think about carnitine repletion and checking that as well. And then vitamin B6 has been the real shocker. Dramatic vitamin B6 decreases to zero. Um, I've seen severe encephalopathies that have gotten multiple CT scans. They think the patient's had a stroke. And I come in the patient on CVVH for two weeks, the B6 level zero. You give the B6 at 50 milligrams a day IV, the patient wakes up. And so um, I've seen that a couple times. And so B6 dramatically falls and gets wasted on CVVH. It's super cheap and easy to replace. Um, not very hard to check. It costs money checking that, of course, but you might think about after seven to 10 days, just giving some B6 or checking the level. Zinc and copper, I'm sorry, zinc and selenium will drop as well. Those might be worth, one, one thought is Greet Vandenberg and Belgium gives all our patients trace and multivitamins in their ICU every day. The, the trace and multivitamins of TPN. You might think about doing that on CVVH. We're looking at that as a strategy right now. Um, we give Flintstones chewables too. Flintstone chewables are the only multivitamin we can find that has copper in it. And so we give those to our CVVH patients down their tubes a lot if they can do that. Um, Cause you'll get some copper from there and maybe you can stave off those deficiencies. But these deficiencies are real and they have significant consequences for your patient. So on CVVH, I'd be looking for them. Um, I, I see what I recommend in multivitamin, even if it goal two feeds, yes, in the CVVH patient. So I think specific to that, um, Susie Levon asked that question, or no, who asked that question? Somebody I see it in here did. Um, so I, I would think about that if they're on CBVH. And then what was the other question? Let me look real quick here, um, if I can see it. I think those were most of them. Um, what about for regular HD? So regular HD does cause some of these, but these deficiencies, but it's much slower and the protein loss is much less. And so the regular HD is less concerning, although we know that HD patients do acquire these deficiencies over time and often get supplemented by their nephrologists. Um, no, CVVH, uh, Abigail, CVVH and CRT are the same. Um, I'm gonna use them interchangeably. So they're the same. Um, so uh, how to speak to the MD about starting TPN? Jennifer Chodas asked when they're concerned about fluid overload and they have multiple drips. I, I mean, I think you really have to convince them that nutrition is essential to the recovery of the patient and, and the ICU cord weakness they have will be a permanent deficit to their life if we don't reduce their muscle wasting now. And then I, you know, I would go with the most concentrated protein formulas you can come up with for your TPN writing, and then we'll give more Lasix or we'll use CVVH, right? I mean, getting fluid off for us is not that hard. Um, I can tell you most right now of my patients, their kidneys are actually working just fine. Um, I'm not as aggressive as diuresing as some medical ICU physicians probably are. Um, I don't know if that's what's causing renal failure. Uh, renal failure has not been as common in this disease in other countries as it seems to be in this country. I don't know if that's a, a, an effect of us diuresing aggressively or not, um, but, but, it, but nutrition is essential and what you guys do is essential. And so I think you should be driving home that, that has to be there. and. We, as the ICU doctors, need to get it off. On CVVH, it should not be a problem. We can take off more, that should not be a problem. Um, we can diurese more if we need to, but nutrition is essential. Um, and so I, I think that is always a challenge though. Um, what are recs for carnitine replacement? Um, we give some routine six and 800 milligrams to replace carnitine for the first week, and then we drop to 300. We've had very good success at 300 a day of carnitine on CVVH, keeping people normal. And so that's a good strategy we've done. Um, let me look back at some of the other questions while we have a minute here. Um, let me just think here, what do we got? Prokinetic meds, we are using prokinetic meds. Watch your QT intervals, especially if you're on chloroquine. Uh, that could be a risk, uh, but we are using Reglan. I used it today. I think erythromycin is not unreasonable too. Keep your pharmacists involved if they're on drugs that prolong QT. Um, or if they're on other drugs that might interact in the liver because chloroquine affects liver metabolism of different drugs. Um, but we did give some Reglan today and, and I would advocate to use it. And it's in the SCCM guidelines and Aspen guidelines as well. So I think that's a, a good choice. We were running out of dialysis machines in New York. Oh, it's brutal there. Um, recommending supplement, which is incredibly low in protein, it is. I think you need to, 
prioritize up to a gram per kilo in those patients. And if you need to use protein supplements to get there, one per gram per kilo is the lowest I will go um, because at that point, one gram per kilo is where we know we can see benefit of that part of nutrition delivery. I wouldn't go below that because at that point you're losing the fundamental, one of the fundamental benefits of, of nutrition delivery at all. And so um, it's devastating you guys are running out of CVH machines. Um, but I, I think protein delivery at one gram per kilo is essential and I think you need to defend that, that line hard. Um, so probiotic paper, we can get that out to you. Let me look back. I'm looking at, at your questions. I'm going to go down to the bottom here. Um, well, what if we don't have CVH capacity? Oh, that's brutal. Uh, that's tough. Um, again, one gram per kilo is my base, and that's where I would go. Um, and then we have to figure out what to do behind that. Um, uh, that's a great question. Oh, boy, not having CVH has got to be tough. Uh, Maybe that's something you can advocate your hospital, find a way to get. Uh, that's that's brutal in this disease state to have to try to manage an ARDS patient who's got renal failure. I, I'm just, my heart goes out to you. Um, COVID patients coming in dehydrated. Um, yeah, I'm sure that's happening. I mean, we found patients coming in much later, much sicker than they, because they don't want to come to the hospital. And that's, I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing renal failure as well. Um, I saw sodium 175 the other day on a patient, which I couldn't believe. I've never seen one that high um, coming in. I think it was the patient just didn't want to come in. Uh, let me see. Pick you here. My pick you doctor is posed as well. Um, recommended doses for vitamin C 1.5 grams per kilo. IV Q6 is the adult recommended dose for vitamin C. Vitamin D um, is still 50 to 100,000 um, for patients. Let me keep going back. Um, 50 to 100,000 of D3, it again, is the recommended um, dose. Ironically, I can't go back more than 10 minutes in your question. So if you had a question that was more than 10 minutes ago, um, repost it because that's the furthest it looks like I can go back in the feed. Uh, so let me go down to the bottom. Um, Probiotic dose and multiple antibiotics. Again, it's so the lactobacillus GG dose that was studied was um, 10 billion CFUs twice a day, and they smeared one in the mouth and they gave one down the feeding tube. Um, the dose we're going to probably study is 10 billion twice a day, um, and I think that's a reasonable place to be with lactobacillus GG. So uh, I think that's a reasonable probiotic dose to be on in a patient. Uh, and so I, I think that's, again, short of other evidence, the best evidence we have probably is around that for the lactobacillus GG. Um, let me look uh, else, the other questions I'm seeing here. Um, why are ferritin levels so high? Ferritin levels are so high because um, sometimes the stress response drives that and changes that. I don't know otherwise why, if there's something specific about COVID and ferritin, um, I don't know that I would use that level to monitor much. It's kind of a nonspecific marker. Um, I'm keeping to looking, I'm continuing to look at your questions. Uh, let me just see, I'm going to go down to the bottom here. Uh, again, I would not use arginine in COVID because the risk is we have data from the past arginine containing immunonutrition trials in pneumonia patients that showed increased death in patients that received arginine containing formulas. This goes back to the original arginine supplement data that Darren Hyland published years ago, um, that there was real potential risk of increased death in arginine containing formulas in patients with pneumonia um, and significant inflammatory responses. And, and we've not really been able to counter that data. And so I would not be giving arginine at more than probably eight to 10 grams a day. I know all formulas have a little bit in them, but if you're giving more than eight to 10 grams a day, I would back that off and I would choose a different formula. Um, as painful as that is, because that's gonna limit some of our really good protein to calorie ratio formulas. But, but this is the disease that causes the hyperinflammation that probably was responsible for those increased deaths back in the day. And so I would be very careful. Um, Administration of printed amino acids, I mentioned that. Um, can you give printed amino acids alone? Um, th that is being done in a study by Darren Hyland called the Nexus trial with um, Dale Needham and Hopkins. It's not something we've ever done, although I guess you could probably do it. Um, do I worry about vitamin C with high ferritin? I, I, I don't know, Judy, that's a good question. Um, I guess I would look at Paul Merrick's papers again, and because I, I don't remember mentioning that, but he may have, and I don't know how to comment on that because I don't know the answer. Um, would I recommend a COVID tool stuff? To, yeah. 
So yes, I would recommend a COVID stool test. Again, there's no evidence validating the COVID stool test yet. So I'm not going to say this is evidence-based, but I will going to say that I've heard of patients and I've with my own eyes seen patients who've had multiple negative swabs who had really high risk factors for COVID or were sick with it and they had positive stools, which is again, terrifying, I know, because we all want to believe once they're negative, we don't have to be so worried about them. But if they have real bad symptoms or if they have real positive exposure risk factors, lots of fevers, potentially someone else that has it at home, check the stool. Check the stool. We're sending multiple stools to see if we can validate that. We're sending, we've even sent VALs on people because we don't have a positive, but we're fearful they're positive. Um, I think it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, so would you avoid post feeding and feed gastric? I would um, for, for Kitty who asked that question. Um, I, I like the monitor you have in the sicker patient of the gastric feeds. And these are patients I would be following residuals on if you can find a way to do that safely and feel good about that. Uh, it's, I think it's just safer. Um, and I think there's risk to pacing post feeds. Um, would you give the same dose of vitamin C to patients with renal failure and not an RRT? Now my sense from Paul America is it has not been an issue to do that. And I have given those doses to some of my renal failure patients. There is of course some reported risk of, of oxalate with vitamin C, but that has not been seen in any of these trials. So um, I, I reread Paul's papers and, and feel good for yourself, but I have given vitamin C to renal failure patients and I've not had problems with it at one and a half grams IV Q6. Uh, and I, I believe Paul was doing the same. and. So, uh, but I'd reread that paper and make sure you feel good about it too, but, but he has not seen problems with those doses. So gastric residual threshold, Holly Ann asked, it's 500. Um, 500 is a gastric residual threshold. That's what's proven in multiple trials. I don't care what the tube feed rate is. I don't want to hear that they're getting 10 cc's an hour. Now the residual is 100, so they must have residuals. That's not data driven. 500 is the cutoff. So that is, that is what you should be using. Um, Lots of people are getting distended. Miralax is not helping. Uh, you could try um, an opiate antagonist, right? One of the one of the various methanoltrexones or opiate antagonists could be useful for these patients that are getting a lot of sedation um, that are having distension and other constipation problems. I don't have a great answer beyond that. Uh, let me just look and see. Um, if the COVID is not positive in the nasal and it's positive in the stool, they're still in droplet, they are. We have those patients still with N95 masks and, and we still have them on. Uh, they're not necessarily negative pressure rooms, um, but when they're well enough to go to the floor, but they are on the N95 mask and the full precautions otherwise. So um, that's how we've handled it um, because we can't tell if they're not infectious. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't feel confident exposing any of my nurses to that or to any view to that. So um, best lab is a quick track disease severity. I don't have a great answer to that. Um, that's tough. Uh, I, I don't have a great way to tell you that. Let me see, AK9 and dialysis. Yep, that's good. Would you recommend feeding VN through an ileus? I wouldn't. I would move to PN. Um, again, our recommendations from Aspen and, and SCCM are recommending earlier PN, and I would do that. Uh, I wouldn't try to feed through an ileus. Um, I, I really think there's a lot of risk there to see anything else that's jumping out at me that I can answer for you guys. Let's see. Um, is it okay to use probiotics using multiple antibiotics? Yes, it is. Um, they've actually saw in a lot of research that's been done, even heat inactivated probiotic bacteria that aren't alive anymore have very beneficial effects. It's the interaction of the bacterial cell wall with receptors in the gut that cause some of the benefit that we see. And so the fact that they're on antibiotics should not dissuade you from using probiotics. Um, there's probiotic cell wall components even that are being used as drugs in IBD. So I think that that is just fine. I wouldn't worry about the antibiotics they're getting. Um, let me just see if I see any others. Um, what I recommend for lipids, if it's, you know, if the lipids are more than 400, 450 after five days, you know, I, I would, re Juice or go to just giving lipids once a week. Um, I, I would reduce them. I mean, if you have really difficult hyperdrigosuridemia, I would reduce your lipid dose. Uh, maybe go to dosing once a week. It's tough to get essential fatty acid deficiency sooner than seven to ten days um, in a reasonably well nourished patient. And so I would, I would, I would, yeah. If you have, and we're seeing it right, um, I would, I would slow it down uh, and give much less, and maybe just go to once a week. And I think that's reasonable to do. 
how, how after we measuring vitamin D levels, I check them once every two weeks, especially if you've given 100,000. I will give 100,000 IU or 100,000 IU of D3 for three days. That usually keeps people up for about 21 days, but I'll, I check it two weeks. So about every two weeks I check. For prone patients, can you bolus feed them during the eight hours they're in supine? Definitely. Um, and I think small intermittent feeds or small boluses would probably be okay in prone position as well. There's no data for that. So I can't tell you it's safe, but I think it probably is reasonable. I wouldn't give the 150 to 180. That's uh, the typical bolus dose. Like we use 150 to 180 Q3 in our normal ICU trauma patients. Um, I wouldn't go that high in the prone patient, but I think it's great to do it then when they're flipped back over because I think then you can feel safer. Um, let me see if I see any others. Any good references for use of probiotics? Um, yeah, the, the, I don't know if I can give you a good reference, but I can definitely give you some of the ventilator associated pneumonia prevention trials that have been used in ICU patients. Um, and again, we have strong evidence that probiotics do not need to be alive when they hit the gut to have their benefits. The IBD docs are way ahead of us. They use probiotic cell wall polymers and they use um, heat inactivated probiotics and the heat inactivated probiotics and a lot of the studies that have been done, at least in the experimental models, are just as effective as the active probiotics that are alive. Um, and so, it, it, again, it's, it's, it's the cell wall components that do some of the beneficial things. Again, we'd love for them to grow and outcompete the pathogens, um, and maybe they still do that in the face of antibiotics. It's hard to say how much ends up in the gut. Um, I, I would not at all be thinking that you know, there's a problem with giving probiotics and antibiotics. In fact, we know from a JAMA publication, those of you who want to go find, if you put into Google JAMA and probiotics for uh, diarrhea, antibiotic associated diarrhea, there's a 50,000 patient meta-analysis that shows probiotics of all different sorts significantly reduce antibiotic associated diarrhea after antibiotic courses. Are, and so I think there's great evidence for repleting the gut uh, with probiotics. Now again, some of those antibiotic courses are completed when they do these studies, but I would not have any issue. The probiotics do not need to be alive to have their benefits. Um, we'd love for them to be alive, but they have benefits without being alive as well. Uh, anything else? Um, what takes priority? Adequate um, protein versus avoid under overfeeding. I mean, definitely avoid overfeeding. Um, my, my son is calling me. Hold on. Um, definitely avoid... Uh, overfeeding as best you can, but adequate protein delivery I think is very important and I would try to do that. I see how long can you permissively underfeed safely. I, I don't think we know that, but I, I think for the first 72 hours is a very reasonable period and probably up to 96 hours, you know, the Eden trial would imply even up to 96 hours is reasonable um, in patients that are very sick that you need to do that. And now realize the Eden trial was um, had an average BMI of 30. Um, these were well-nourished patients who many of whom didn't weren't long stairs like our COVID patients often are. So it's hard to equate that data to the patients we're seeing now, but I think permissive underfeeding up to 72 hours has probably even been official, and it's probably okay in the sickest patients out to um, a little further. But you know, ideally, what I would do is at 72 hours in these very sick patients, our guidelines even recommend you should be thinking about starting TPN in patients you're not able to feed. If you are able to permissively underfeed, you can probably wait to 72 to 96 hours, and then if you're not at 50 to 60 percent of goal feeding, then you can think about TPN supplementally in those patients. But our guidelines, SCCM and Aspen, are advocating for earlier TPN, I would do that. And so uh, I think that would be great. Um, after extubation, how long to continue the 15 to 20? Um, again, I, I, after five days, I would be going to 25 to 30 in, in these patients um, probably, and definitely by seven days, I'd wanna be at 25 at least or 30. So after extubation, I would not be permissively underfeeding them anymore. That's not going to be good. They're going to waste more muscle and uh, I wouldn't be doing that. So any other questions before we go? You guys have been great. You have tons of great questions. Um, I would be happy to do this again if you would want. Um, and I'm happy to share these papers. As I said before, my email is my name, paul.wishmeyer at duke.edu. And um, you can Again, a lot of this stuff I'm putting on Twitter at Paul underscore Wishmeyer, so you can follow there, or on uh, Instagram is another great place, Paul underscore Wishmeyer MD. Uh, and so um, please feel free to send questions. I'm happy to send you papers. I'm happy to post some more of the papers, um, all of these things. So um, let me let, let uh, Priscilla know, and thank you to her. This has been 
a really valuable resource, this page you've created. I've told a, a good number of the uh, nutrition companies about it and advocated that they um, try to take advantage of the podcast they're all generating. And I'm going to be sending you a link to a podcast I did last night with Abbott and with David Evans that you guys can listen on specific to COVID nutrition. Um, but this has been really great. Uh, and please um, let me know if we can do this again for those of you who missed it. Um, I'm happy to take new questions as well. Feel free to email me and Priscilla, of course. Thank you again. This has really been wonderful. And, and I just want to say thank you to all of the dietitians out there who are really your, our front line, who are fighting this fight, really are the front line providers in this war. You guys really are an inspiration to me and to everyone for, for, for being there for your patients because nutrition matters, right? You, you guys are saving lives with nutrition and you need to fight for it, I know, because we're often last on the list, but you can't give up because it is gonna be the nutrition you give now that's gonna get America back to work after they recover from this and get them out of months to years of ICU acquired weakness and months to years of disability. Just, we know that the getting to 80% of the goal calories in that first week of the patient who's intubated more than eight days improves quality of life six months later. That was a paper we did out of the Redox data where we showed patients for every 25% increase in calories and protein you deliver in the first week. The first week is where it's most important of protein and calories you reduce disability at six months and three months later. So the what you feed in the first week to 10 days changes patients' lives for months and years to come. I'm happy to share that paper as well as in critical care medicine. And so you guys are changing lives with what you're pulling off in the first seven to 10 days. Don't hesitate to start TPN sooner. If you don't have some off lipid or olive oil lipid in your hospital, get rid of the intralipid, get that to all your patients. Uh, and um, I look forward to talking to all of you again and getting your emails and getting your questions. Um, thanks to everyone and please stay safe. And again, thank you for everything you do. There's not enough appreciation that could go out for the lives that RDs are saving in this country. All right, everybody have a good night and I look forward to talking to you again soon.